things to catch up on, to, to get ahead, but yet you chose to be here tonight to, uh, to encourage your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and to get a recharge on your, on your faith and to, to worship God. And that's something that is, that is commendable. And so we appreciate uh, your presence tonight. Uh, my name is, is Seth Parnell, and I'm not the, the same speaker that was here last week. Uh, I, I heard that you had my brother Josh here, uh, who spoke here last week, and I've been uh, confused you know, for my brother uh, more times than, than I can count. You know, being uh, the same size and everything, we, I get, I've been called Josh you know, several times. But I hope, but I hope you enjoyed him, and I hope that uh, you're ready to study tonight uh, in God's Word. But we're going to be in um, 1 Corinthians. Uh, chapter 15, and we're going to kind of move around uh, tonight. But tonight we're going to take a look at a very, uh, a very unusual event, a very uh, unique event that happened in the history of the world. It came a time when, uh, in the town of Jerusalem, a rumor started swirling about about this very unique event. People were going crazy about something special uh, that had happened. It turns out rumors were flying around about. The this, this man, this dead man, who had been uh, killed in the sight of everybody, who had been killed in the sight of all the people, this dead man was out of his tomb, and he was walking around, and he was talking to people. This man who had been killed it was no longer in his tomb, but he is now you know, up and walking, just like a normal person, just like a person who had never been killed before. These rumors uh, were swirling around, just as if he were alive. So we're going to talk about this, this dead man who that was walking uh, tonight. And you may have seen something on, on the, in the movies, you know, something, if you watch a, a scary movie, you may see you know, the, the, the dead you know, rise up and attack the people, or the zombies seem to be you know, pretty, pretty popular these days. Maybe you, you've seen them in a, a TV show or something. But what we're talking about tonight is not a, a movie, it's not a story that was written for entertainment, but this is something that is, is real life. This is something that is, is factual history, something that is real. This is something that is, is as real as me talking to you right now. This is, what we're talking about tonight uh, is truth. Because we're going to talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of our Lord. You know, even though this is something that, that happened you know, over 2,000 years ago, this is something that affects us even today. It affects me and it affects you as well. And it affects us in a way that sometimes we don't even realize you know, how important this, was, this event was uh, to us. Because this is something that is a, a pillar you know, of our faith. You know, if you are a new Testament Christian uh, the, this evening, then this is something that is a, is a pillar you know, of your faith. It's something that is absolutely necessary for you to be, uh, to be saved. You know, the fact that Jesus you know, overcame death itself, and the fact that he did something that no man on this earth could, could ever do, you know, overcoming death, you know, makes him a, a very unique person, makes him something that this world has, has never seen. This world has never uh, produced, and it proves that he truly was the very Son of God. Because you know, we know from experience, you know, in this life, you know, even the the greatest of men, even the best men, you know, they are subject uh, to death, and they have never been able to conquer it. You know, it doesn't matter you know, how powerful you are. It doesn't matter you know, how wealthy you are. It doesn't matter you know how talented or any any of the above. You know, we all we are all subject to death. And it's something that comes to every man uh, at his time. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, it says that as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, uh, the judgment. You know, we are given you know, two, two promises you know, in, that, in that verse. One, that you know, we, we will have a time that is appointed in which you know, we will die, in which we will leave this earth. And after you know, that time has come, we will face the judgment. We will face a time in which we will have to answer for what we have used our time on this earth for, and whether it was for good or for bad, you know, for righteousness or for evil. We'll have to answer for what we use this life that God gave us for. You know, we'll have to face the judgment. But Jesus, you know, through the power of God, was, was raised you know, from that tomb and was able uh, to, walk, to walk again. And this... 
this event is something that really, really proves, you know, that Jesus was you know, who he said he was. It really proves that he was the, the genuine article, that he was, you know, the very uh, son of God. If you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and read, uh, how, read the, the words that Paul tells to the church there in Corinth, he talks about uh, the resurrection. And he tells them if that tomb uh, was empty, if, that, if the tomb where they put Jesus, if, that, if he was still there, then you know, what does that do to our faith? He says that our faith is, is worthless. He says it's, it's non-existent. You know, in fact, he, at the end uh, of, the, of the section in there in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he tells us you know, that we are to be a people that are most pitied. You know, people should feel sorry for us if the resurrection you know, wasn't true. Because we would be a people that spent all this effort, that spent you know, all this time believing in someone who wasn't who he said he was. You know, believing in someone who was essentially you know, crazy because he told us that, you know, that he was going to you know, die, you know, be dead for three days, and then rise again. You know, they, he would be you know, just another person you know, with a crazy idea if the resurrection you know, wasn't true. But through the scriptures, you know, we can be assured that it indeed was true and that Jesus really did rise from the grave. But we're going to kind of travel, travel backwards you know, from this, this event, that from Jesus you know, actually you know, rising from the grave. And we're going to kind of look at you know, some reasons you know, why this had to happen. Because when you look at this, when you look at this event of the resurrection, you know, in order for one to uh, to be resurrected, you know, he first he must die. You know, there's there's many people out there who come up with a a number of theories, you know, to explain the resurrection, saying, you know, Jesus, you know, he didn't really die on the cross. You know, he was just, he just passed out, or you know, the the disciples, you know, they they played a trick on them. They try to you know, bring up you know all these different theories to explain to uh, to try to scientifically explain the resurrection, you know, without the power of God. But that is simply uh, simply impossible. But one must first die, and second, in order for one to, to die, he first must be alive. And in order for one to be alive, you know, he first, you know, must be born. And so, we're going to, to look at, you know, some of, some events that led uh, to this to this resurrection in the first place. You know, I, you know, I don't uh, I don't have any kids, but I've, I've worked at a number of of church camps uh, throughout uh, this year. And one thing that I've realized, you know, working with kids is that they always want to know why. You know, they always have to have a reason, you know, for doing something. You know, if you tell them to, you know, go clean your cabin, well, they're going to ask, you know, why? You know, why, why do I have to do that? It's just going to get dirty tomorrow. I'm just going to mess it up. You know, why do I have to do that? You know, they, they have to have a reason, you know, for everything. And so we're going to look at why did Jesus, you know, why did he have to, to die? And why didn't he have to be raised you know, from that grave? And why didn't he have to go through, through this process that uh, he did? Well, in order to get there, we first you know, must ask a question. And that question is, where does the story of Christ begin? When you look at the gospel story, where, and in your mind, where does the story of Jesus Christ uh, start? You, know, you, may look, you, may, you may go back to the, the beginning of Jesus' ministry, back to the point in which he st begins to go out and to preach uh, his message. He goes out and he begins to perform many different miracles. You know, he, he feeds the 5,000. You know, he he uh, turns water to wine. You know, he walks on water. He does all these amazing and incredible miracles uh, for the people to see. And then he tells a number of parables as well. He, you know, he tells you know, the, the parable you know, of, of the sower, you know, the parable of the prodigal son, the good Samaritan, you know, stories you know, that we remember, things that we associate with Jesus. And you know, we know that's, those are things that Jesus did. You know, we may go think you know, that is when Jesus, uh, his story began. Or you may go back to the scene of a little town called Bethlehem and the scene where a baby is lying in a manger. And he's lying in the, in the ba this baby that was born you know, to a virgin girl. And these, these, these wise men come and they bring him gifts. And there's great you know, praising and glorifying of God going on uh, throughout this little town because of this child. You may go back uh, to that scene as the beginning you know, of the story of Christ. But in my mind, you have to go back to the book to the book of Genesis, the very beginning of the Bible, in order to see the beginning of the story of Christ. 
And as in, because in the book of Genesis, when we read about some events that take place that really, really, really follow mankind all throughout its history. In Genesis chapter 3, we read about the story of the two, the two first people that would walk this earth. A man by the name of Adam and a woman by the name of Eve. And they would be people that would have a very unique relationship with God, being able to walk and talk with Him in the Garden of Eden. But throughout the course of their time there, they would eventually get into this conversation uh, with a being that's described as a serpent. And throughout this, this conversation, He convinces them that they should go against what God had told them to do and, eventually, and essentially you know, rebel against the, His Word. You know, they, they, he convinced them that you know, his way was, was better you know, than, than God's way. You know, he, that throughout this garden, you know, there was one tree that God had told them, you know, don't, don't take part of this tree. You know, leave it alone. You know, that, that's not for you. But the serpent you know, essentially uh, uh, convinces them. You, he says, you know, uh, God, you know, he's, he's holding out on you. you know, this is going to be good. You're, you're going to be you know, like God you know, if you take part of this fruit. And so as we know the story, you know, Eve eventually uh, takes part of the fruit, then Adam takes part of the fruit, and then we find that after this deed was done, you know, sin is born into the world. Because of this uh, act of rebelling against God, they were expelled from the garden, and they can no longer enjoy this, this uninterrupted uh, of relationship with God. But they, were, had to, they had to have this kind of distant relationship with Him, because the sin had entered in uh, to this world and had entered in to their lives. And because God you knew he he could not you know, uh, he could not be part of something that was completely against his nature as sin is you know sin cannot be uh, anything cannot be you know anything associated with God because God is pure and God is holy and so mankind had to figure out you know, a way around this problem of sin and the, the the in the Old Testament there's a prophet by the name of Habakkuk you know a, a very common name here in, in the United States you know, a man by the name of, of Habakkuk. And in chapter 1, and verse 13, it says that when Habakkuk is talking about God, he says, your eyes are too pure to look on evil, and you cannot tolerate wrongdoing. And if you go to the New Testament, in Romans chapter 5, and verse 12, uh, Paul says, he says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. He said, you know, death has, has passed upon all men because that is the, the consequence of sin. Your know, sin is essentially, you know, breaking God's command. It's, do, it's going against uh, His commands. It's rebelling against uh, His rule. You know, it's going against something that, that He has told us, you know, not to do. And sin is usually something that is, is detrimental to us, you know, anyway. You know, it's usually, the sins that we read about in the Bible is usually something that is harmful for us in the first place. And you can probably, you probably in your lifetime have heard numerous stories about people you, who have had uh, things such as alcohol, you know, ruin their life. You know, when they become addicted to it and it just you know, makes them do things that they, they would never do, you know, uh, in a million years, you know, if, if they had a clear mind. You may have seen a person that was, got addicted to drugs or you may have seen, you know, a person whose life is, is shattered, you know, by, by addiction. Or we know from, we know from the, the laws of this land, if you go and steal something you know, and you get caught, you know, what's going to happen to you? you know, you're going to get thrown in jail. You know, sin is usually, you know, at its source, it's, it's something that is detrimental and, and bad for us. It's harmful for us. But even if we were, even if you were a person who, whose life was, was completely shattered you know, by addiction, or if, even if you were a person who ended up in jail for the rest of your life because of something that you did, that would not be the, the most damaging thing that sin could do to you. Because the, the worst thing, the most deadly a aspect of sin is that it separates us from God. And that separation from God is something that means you know, more to us than anything that this world uh, can can throw at you. You know, it's something that 
that is uh, you know that is what can break you know, that can affect us you know so so much you know God has has given us you know so many uh, promises in his word when you three read throughout the scriptures you know there is so many different uh, different promises that he has given to his children you know, who are faithful to him and one of those promises is that of heaven you know he has promised us to, to those who are faithful to him to those you know, who are who have walked that narrow road and and uh, stay true to him you know there is a reward of heaven you know a land where you know there will be no sorrow you know no pain you know no no depression you know no stress because heaven will be a place where God is where you can enjoy you know, that that presence you know, with God you know, and it's in my opinion that you know we our minds can't fully comprehend you know how good heaven is going to be and how magnificent it's going to be you know there's no way that we can ever relate to to how good it's going to be but that you but that is you know, that is the reward of, of a faithful Christian. But the scriptures tell us that if one is covered in sin, if one is, uh, is imbued you know, with a lifestyle of sin, then he cannot get into heaven because heaven, sin cannot be allowed in heaven. It cannot enter into uh, heaven. And so sin is, is something that bars us you know, from those promises of God. In Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 6, this is what Isaiah talks about the people of Israel. And he says, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. And in the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41, when in the words of Jesus, he says, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you curse it into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. You know, sin is something that, that separates us from God. It's something that, that bars us you know, from his promises. It puts the promises of God you know, at, a, at a distance to where we can't partake of them. And, and you know, it's something that, that Jesus Jesus talks about here in Matthew uh, chapter 25. And so, you know, he, he has to say to those who, who choose to remain in sin, who make that choice to not be saved you know, by his grace, you know, he has to say to them, you know, depart from me. You know, I never, I never knew you into uh, eternal fire. And we know that, you know, ju just as heaven, you know, is a, a very real place, it's a very real promise that God has given us, you know, hell is also a very real place as well. You cannot believe in heaven and not believe uh, in hell because they're on the very they're on the they come from the very same source and but hell is something that is it's not it's not a place that is prepared you know for for you and, and for me you know it's you know a lot of people have problems with you know harmonizing the idea of, of hell and a God who is spoken of as a, as a loving God you know, as a God of love but hell is not a place that was prepared you know, for for you or, or for me but it was a place that it was prepared you know, for sin and if sin is something that is, is too big of a sacrifice you know, for us to give up if it's something that is too part too big of a part you know, of our life then we will we will go we will follow it you know, to its destination you know, but it's not a place that was prepared you know, for for you and me so we so we find you here as a people that have been covered in sin you know, we have an extremely uh, difficult problem how are we going to to get rid of this problem of sin. How could a people who was full of sin you know, ever be near to God? Well, this is one of the, the very reasons why Jesus was born into this world in the first place. Why he ever took a step on this earth and why he ever went through what he did. You can just look at the words of the great prophet uh, John the Baptist that we read about in John chapter 1 verse, uh, verse 29. It says, and then the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the only answer to this problem of sin you know, that we have. He is the only way in which we can be free from sin and free from those restrictions that it places upon us. In fact, in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, this is what it says. It says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. 
You know, there is no other uh, option. There's no other al alternative source. But Jesus is the only one who offers salvation. That's the only way we can be saved. There is no other way to be free from sin but through Jesus Christ. And so sin was the reason why Jesus was born and why he went through uh, what he did. And he was a man who lived for for not any, any glory of his own. He didn't live for any fame or any fortune. But he was a man who came to this earth you know, for a purpose and for a reason. You know, that is why he, he suffered a death, and a death that was a cruel death, a, a traitor's death, you know, a death that was for a, a criminal. You know, that's why you know, there's nothing, nothing glamorous you know, about that. But Jesus, he knew he was here you know, for a purpose. You know, death by crucifixion was one of the absolutely you know, worse ways that, that they could uh, kill a person you know, at that time. It was an agonizing process that took hours you know, to complete. And even, the, even in Jesus' case, with the torture that went on you know, before he actually got to the cross, you, it's something that is, we can't imagine you know, how much pain was going through his body and how, how, and how uh, intense you know, that this situation was uh, for him. Because you know, crucifixion, it was often uh, used as a way to, to send a message. You know, people, uh, if there was ever a rebellion you know, in a nation you know, at that time, a lot of times they would take the leaders you know, of that rebellion and they would have them uh, crucified. Because they wanted to, you know, to send the message you know, that you know, we're not going to tolerate this. That this is what we do to people you know, who rise up against us. You know, and that's kind of a reason why the Pharisees you know, wanted Jesus to be crucified. You know, they didn't want to, to stab him in the dark. You know, they didn't you know, walk up behind him and, you know, with a knife and, and try to kill him that way. But they wanted him crucified because they wanted to send a message to the people you know, that, that this man you know, is not the Son of God. That this man was a phony you know, and he's crazy and you should, you should listen to us. You know, they wanted to send that message, but it ended up backfiring on them because of what we know happened later. You know, Jesus, he was... He was you know, killed you know, like a criminal, and he knew a uh, full well. When Jesus came down to this earth, he knew that the only way you know, out of this, of this uh, life that he lived here on this earth, the only way out was through the cross, you know, through the, uh, the events that led throughout Jerusalem and on that hill of Golgotha. That was the only way that he was going to, to be free you know, from this life. And nobody tricks Jesus into doing this. Nobody you know, pulled his arm or nobody had to convince him of it. But Jesus did this you know, of his own a free will and out of his love you know, for us. And because it's, it's the love that uh, for us is what motivated Jesus to do this in the first place. You know, because we would be a lost people. You have know, people without hope or without uh, Jesus. You know, this... But even in this, this time of, of desperate suffering, in this time that, that, uh, of intense agony that Jesus went through you know, for you and me, to, on the cross, you know, through all the, the, the pain and the suffering that he went through, even throughout the, this entire process, Jesus never forgot the purpose from why he was doing this, the purpose for why he set foot on this earth in the first place, and the f purpose of why he was hanging on that cross. In fact, in Luke chapter 23, in verse uh, 20, we read about the statement that he made while he was hanging on the cross. And, and, and during this, uh, while he was hanging on the cross, it says, Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. You know, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. You know, those who put him you know, on the cross, those who nailed those nails in his hands, you know, those who made fun of him and mocked him while he was up there, you know, they were the reason why he was up there you know, on that cross. And he, he never lost sight of that. He never lost sight that sin was the reason why, that he was there and that he was there to overcome sin and to free us you know, from the chains that, that it binds us with. And but for you know for us that's something that is for us is, is all we're all too easy to uh, to lose sight of, of why we are here you know lose sight you know, of the purpose as to why we are on this life you know we get you know, sometimes we get drawn away in, in, in eight different directions you know in the busy lives that we lead you know we we have to go here and do this and you know, do that and we we have you know, a hundred things you know, on our plate and sometimes we lose we lose sight of the purpose 
purpose of why we are here you know, on this earth. You know, the purpose that we have as, as followers of God and as, as Christian uh, soldiers. You know, we, there, this, life is some, this life that God has given us is something that is, is so precious. You know, it's something that is uh, so valuable. And there's so much more to this life than to, than to make money, to be entertained, and to, to grow old. You know, there's so much more to this life than that. But to live you know, for the glory of God and to know what His commands are and to, to share those with other people, to give life to other people through what Jesus offers. You know, that's our, our true purpose here on earth. You know, we, are, we shouldn't be people who live for ourselves, you know, who, just to live to gratify you know, desires that we have and to promote ourselves, but to live you know, for the glory of God. You know, that's the true calling for a Christian. You know, that is something that, you know, that every one of us you know, should aspire uh, to do and to know what, the way that God has commanded us to live and to apply that you know, to our life. You know, that should be our true uh, purpose. But you know, as incredible as those those words were, you're saying, "Your Father, you'll forgive them." Those wouldn't be the last words that Jesus you know, would say. Because as we said you know, before, they, when those women you know, came to that tomb, they found it uh, empty. You know, they was, there was no one there. Jesus rose from the grave because he is the very uh, Son of God. And so it's something that we can celebrate. You know, we can you know, celebrate this you know, every day because, because of this, this is something that gives us life. And because of this, we are free uh, from sin. If you look in, in Romans uh, chapter 6 in verses 13, starting in verse 13, if you have your Bibles, I, I encourage you to turn there as we'll read a couple passages uh, from what Paul has to say here. But Romans chapter 6, starting in verse, verse 13. Romans chapter 6. Starting in verse 13, this is what Paul says. He says, Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves for the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, and have become slaves of righteousness." You know, Paul here, he talks about the idea of, of being a, a slave, you know, a slave to righteousness you know, or a slave uh, to sin. And it's true that, you know, that we are, that whatever we are obedient to, you know, whatever we, we follow, you know, we can follow you know, our own desires, you know, what benefits me, you know, we can follow that, or we can follow uh, what, just what the world tells us, you know, just go with the flow, you know, or we can follow the words of God. We can follow the words, you know, of righteousness. But whatever we, we obey, whatever path that we choose, you know, Paul says and we become uh, slaves to that. We become, oh, we, we become servants, you know, of that. And so if we remain in a life of sin, if we choose a lifestyle of sin to be something that describes you know, our life, that describes you know, what we do uh, every day, something that, a life that goes against what God has, has commanded us to do. You know, if, we, if we choose to make that decision to, uh, to have sin remain in our life, then we will have to take the consequences of that decision. And the consequences of sin that we know is, is that of death. You know, in Romans chapter 6, you know, and, and later on in the passage that we read in verse 23, you know, he says that the wages of sin you know, is death, and the, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, you know, our Lord. You know, we will, you, know, you can be a, a person you know, that, that chooses to be a, a slave you know, of the world, chooses to be a slave you know, of, of yourself. And essentially, as we, as we talked about you know, at the beginning of this lesson, we talked about a, a dead man. You know, that was walking. 
Well, we can be true, a true dead people walking if we don't have the, the, uh, the, uh, the love of God and His commands. It's uh, something that is inscribed you know, on our heart. You know, just because you know, we can walk around and we can, we can talk to people you know, doesn't mean that we are alive inside. doesn't mean that we are spiritually alive. But we can be a dead man that is walking. But through the grace of God that, that freely flows you know, from Him, you know, we have the option, uh, we have the, the choice to make of life. You know, instead of a person you're know, walking towards death, we can be a person that, that takes hold of this life that He has given us, this precious life that comes you know, from nowhere else. You know, there, there's, I think, in my mind, you know, the, the most victorious moment that, that ever happened you know, on this earth. You know, it, what not, you know, it wasn't a war that was won. You know, it wasn't a victory by, by any sort of, of contestant. But the most victorious moment you know, that ever happened on this earth was when that stone was rolled away. Because when that stone was rolled away, that means we, as followers of God, you know, we have life and we have freedom uh, from sin. And so that's what the resurrection means to us. It's our spiritual life. And so we can see the importance that it holds holds for you and for me. But when we, when we began this, this lesson, you know, we, I, or in the middle, we asked you know, the, the question, you know, when does the, the story of Christ begin? You know, when, when does his, his story begin? Well, I want to ask you tonight, when does the story of Christ begin in your life? Or is it so, has it been something that has begun at all? Has it been something that you have, have put off you know, for a, a long time? Something that you've heard you know, over and over but never decided to take action on it? Or has it been you know, something that you've, you've just seen you know, from a distance? You just observed you know, other, other people doing? You know, has it, or has it, has it been something that has you know, taken hold you know, in your life? You know, where does the story of Christ begin with you? You may have been a Christian for, for 50 years, you know, and, may, and you may have a, a long story to tell of Christ you know, working in your life. Or maybe you've, you've obeyed you know, Christ you know, this year, and it's just beginning. Or maybe it hasn't begun at all. I encourage you tonight for, to, to look you know, at your life and the, at the relationship that you have have with God, because there's nothing, uh, there's nothing even more important in this world than where our standing you know, with God and our relationship with Him, because that the the consequences of that relationship is something that extends you know, even beyond this earth. You know, even when everything here you know, fades away and is washed away, you know this relationship with God you know, will remain, and we can you know, reap the promises of it. And so, in order for this resurrection to mean anything to you. You. you must first know who Jesus is, and you must obey the commands that he has given us. You know, we know from the scriptures that God has told us you know, how to become you know, a Christian. You know, through, through the waters of baptism, you know, through believing in him, and through taking action you know, on our life and changing it in a way in which it is not part of, of what we have done before. It's not part of what the world tells us is okay. But it's something that follows you know, the, the commands that God has given given us, and it's something that represents him well, that glorifies him, you know, every day. You know, that, you know, that is how God has chosen to add people, you know, to his family. And if it's something that, that you have decided to do tonight, if it's something that you maybe have been thinking about it for a while, or maybe you've just, you know, started thinking about it just recently, you know, we want to provide, you know, every single opportunity we can to strengthen your relationship and give you, you know, that grace that God offers you. You know, we want you to have that, that, that bond you know, with him. And we want you to have life that the resurrection offers us. So if we can help you in any way, we ask you to please uh, come forward now as we sing our invitation song. Days are filled with sorrow.